this might be absolutely crazy for me to even bring up. Feel free to roast me in the comments if you're listening to this and just completely disagree. Geno Smith, he is the leading pastor in all of football. Should we move on or at least give some reps to Sam Howell with where things are going, with how things are looking? If they lose this game against the Rams, do you try to trade some pieces before the deadline? It's a must win for both teams. Whoever doesn't win it, you kind of probably start looking for next year. Before we get into it, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company based here in the Pacific Northwest. Make sure to use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And with that, let's get into the podcast. The Buffalo Bills come into Seattle and they absolutely roll the Seahawks. We might have a bad Seahawks team this year. That just might be what what happens. You know, it was 31 to 3 into the fourth quarter of this game. The Buffalo Bills out yardaged the Seahawks 445 total yards to 233. Passing yards, they had 281. The Seahawks had 201. Rushing yards, the Bills had 164 rushing yards. The Seattle Seahawks, 32 rushing yards. The leading rusher for the Seahawks, Geno Smith, five carries for 16 yards. Kenneth Walker, nine carries for 12 yards. The drives that they had, you know, down in the red zone, you know, turnover on downs on the one yard line, Geno Smith tripping over the center to end the drive. I mean, just summed up the game. This is, this is awful to watch. The, uh, the Bills time of possession was 38 minutes and some change. The Seahawks was 22 minutes. What are, what are your initial takeaways from this? If any? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and put lipstick on a pig. You're probably an outside looking in team when it comes to the playoffs. Like, I think that this kind of solidifies that Um, you're going to be a team that's going to be good enough to where you'll be in the hunt. You'll be in the graphic, but you're probably not going to make it. And you're about to go on your toughest stretch of the season right here. Like the bills was the start of your big run on like how difficult this season is going to be. You might see a lot of, you know, it. it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. But then you might see a run at the end where, you know, at the end of the season, it's like, oh, well, the boys figured it out. They got hot. And it's like, well, are you schedule merchants or what's going on? Now, the funny thing that, you know, talking about this preseason, it's like I remember going through the schedule and doing my Mike Francesa win, loss, win, you know, whatever. Had him at four and four. So you're kind of about where everyone expected. You just didn't expect to lose to New York. You didn't expect to beat Miami. And then you didn't expect to get absolutely mollywhopped by Buffalo. The thing that Buffalo is just showing you is how bad your run defense is. It might have gotten better under McDonald, which I do believe it has. You still got a long ways to go. They are a big physical offensive line. And even with Byron Murphy in there, they whooped your butt. They were knocking you off the ball. And every single time it felt like a linebacker got to cook, he'd already gotten four yards and he had a head full of steam. Like you're not going to win a lot of football games like that. Now there's some luck. I mean, you were able to turn over Josh Allen for the first time in the season and if you really think about it, at one point, this game was 14 to three and you were on the one yard line. The issue is that it's kind of a microcosm of what the Seahawks team has been all year. Like there was a big mistake. Usually it's been a pre-snap penalty or a holding or a block in the back or an interception. And this time you had an offensive lineman that had to lose ground to gain ground. You know, he's got to take a step back so that he can get in front of the D lineman that he's trying to get over to Geno Smith. He's mostly a shotgun quarterback. You know, it's not just Geno. It's the entire NFL. How many guys do you see truly going under center? How often do you see them going under center? And then they also have to understand that in a situation like that, what you're asking the center there to do is he has to get over to a two eye, a guy who's shaded inside technique of the guard. It's the furthest block that that guy has to make. And for him to square that player up, He's got to lose ground. He can't just go straight across. He'll never get there or he'll get blown up, right? So he's losing ground. And because everything's in shotgun now, there's a lost art to what your footwork is as a quarterback behind a center when you're under center in a situation like that where it's going to hit fast. That guy has to move fast. He has to lose ground quickly so that he can do his job and protect you. And so I think in that situation, you know, it just gets a little sloppy. Look, I don't think that the center needed to drop back as far as he did. But also at the same time, Geno Smith can't have his feet there. His feet got to be moving faster, right? You can't get caught there in that spot. And then when you take the sack, it's now on the five-yard line. Yeah, they're still backed up, but you don't have a chance for a safety and to get that football back. Now, you could very easily have this game at 14-10 to 10 going into halftime, 
And now you're singing a different tune in that locker room. Instead, it's 14 to three and it's, well, we have to get a stop on this drive. If we don't get a stop on this drive, this game is over and Buffalo drives down, they score and the game is essentially over at that point. Right. And then you get, you get a garbage time touchdown, but I just look at this, you know, you're kind of going into the season, hoping that you are a fringe playoff team in a wild card spot. Unfortunately, with how well the, the North is playing and how well a couple of the teams in the South have played, like you're, you're probably on the outside looking in, like you are probably not a playoff team. Right now, when I look at it, yeah, the North has to play each other. They're going to get two teams minimum. I think there's a decent chance that they get three. Then you have to look over at the East between the Commanders and Philly. Like, those are two good football teams, and they're going to be right there. You know, all of a sudden, the Rams, they're hurt for most of the early part of the season. Now you get to play them, and all of a sudden, they're fully healthy. It's the same thing that happened with San Fran. The Cardinals, they're frisky. They have games where they look horrible. They have games where they look awesome. So what kind of Arizona Cardinal team are you going to get? I just think this has all the makings of you are essentially, and if you're a Portland Trailblazer fan, you understand this, you are in no man's land. You are going to be good enough to where you're in the conversation for making the playoffs. You might make the playoffs, but you're not going to do anything in the playoffs. You're going to play a better team, and unless they have a hurt quarterback, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to win, or you're going to be essentially mathematically eliminated week 15 16 or 17 like you're going to be right there but you'll get eliminated there'll be a buzz hey if we just do this we can run the table hey now these are winnable games you know that you're going to hear from a lot of talking heads and you're probably just on the outside looking in and that's frustrating because you're not going to get a big enough draft pick where they come in right away and completely change everything but you're also not good enough to justify like having you know one of the last 10 picks in the first round Like it just, it it sucks. You're kind of in purgatory. Yeah. It's like that weird spot. And, you know, let's say they did get that fourth and one, they scored a touchdown. Yay. It's now 31, 17, you know, I mean, the the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Buffalo looked like they were able to do kind of whatever they wanted to on that opening drive. It was 14 plays, 90 yards. They finished off with that touchdown pass to Coleman. You know, he he just goes up in the air. They used him a lot. Great catch. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, the cornerback didn't even know what was going on by the time the ball was in his hands. And the corner right. had one of his hands pinned. Like, actually, if you watch it, the corner makes a good play on the ball. Really? Coleman just takes that ball, pins it to his chest, and holds on. I mean, right. there's a reason why they drafted him where they did. He's a former Michigan State basketball player. Like, he went to Michigan State to play basketball and football. And then he realized, like, hey, I'm probably not a top five pick in the NBA draft. I'm going to go play this football thing. He transfers over to Florida State. That's why they drafted him. Let him go up and make catches over people. Coleman's a beast, you know? And I know early on people were ripping on him and everyone saw the worthy end around and, oh, look at what Kansas City has. Look at what Kansas City has. I'll tell you right now, I think when we look back on that trade in four years, I think there's a conversation about Buffalo being the ones that actually won that trade, not Kansas City. That uh, that reminds me of uh, Jimmy Graham, you know, for the Saints. Yeah. He played basketball for the Hur- for the Miami Hurricanes and also football. Yeah. Or did he play? Yeah, yeah. And then he – I think he picked Saints. up football later on. Like, I actually think yeah. he went there just to play basketball, and then it was like – I think you're right. Hey, if I continue to try and play basketball, I'm going to go pro in something other than sports. So why don't I try out this football thing and maybe I can go pro in sports. And I mean, it's just a long list of guys who have done that before. I, there are times where I wish Seattle would, you know, if you get a one-on-one matchup, well, you just go throw the fade ball to DK. You know, he's so much bigger and stronger than everyone. Why not take a chance with it? But also at the same time, you know, if they don't come down with it, it's a difficult catch. Coleman made a great play. You know, it, it is what it is. You don't have the excuse anymore of the defense being banged up. You're not banged up. You should be better. You should be better against the run. And you got bullied. Now, to be fair, you got bullied against probably, at worst, a top five team in the NFL, probably a top three team in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And so there is some solace in that of, hey, you have a ways to go. And you've beaten a playoff team. I think Atlanta is going to make the playoffs. And you beat them. You beat them down in their place. So you can go to battle and you can go to war with some of the worst, you know, not worst, but not as good playoff teams. 
But when you go up against the true Super Bowl contenders, like frankly, you're just you're just not there. Just going full circle on that tangent with Jimmy Graham, I had to look it up real quick. He played basketball at the University of Miami from 2005 to 2009. He graduated in May of 2009. Then he went to take graduate classes while playing that season for football. So Mm -hmm. 2009, after he graduated from college, he went to graduate school just to play football. And then he ended up finishing with 17 receptions, 213 yards, five touchdowns, and then getting drafted. So, but then coming back, the, the Seahawks allowed James Cook to go 17 y- carries for 111 yards, two touchdowns. Like we could go on about the negatives until we're blue in the face. One thing that I wanted to touch on was I've heard reports that it was basically an away game for the Seahawks. Like when was the last time that something like that has happened? I mean, it's been packed in Seattle for the past 15 years. The 12s have been insanely loud. You know, I, I wasn't able to tell over TV necessarily, but from the people that were there, it seemed like there was a, a blue out at the stadium. What did you hear about that? Uh, I didn't hear much. I mean, on the TV coverage, you're not going to be able to tell. Cause I was the same way. It was like, okay, like I see more Buffalo yeah. fans than I expected, but how much of a difference does that really make? It sounds like it's like most things in the NFL, people are getting priced out and it sucks because at the end of the day, it, 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 I don't want to just come out and say, Oh, it's greedy ownership or it's this or it's that, but it, it, that's exactly what it is. You know, Back in the day, you could afford to take a family to a football game, or it would be easier for others to get tickets to a football game. And some of it is it's Buffalo and Bill's Mafia travels and they've always traveled well. If you're a Seattle Seahawks fan and you buy season tickets, there are going to be games where you don't get to go to. So then you're going to sell it on the secondary market. And right now, if you're willing to travel to Seattle to a place you've never been, you're going to be willing to spend a little bit more money on tickets it's expensive to go to an nfl game like no offense to the nfl and it's something that they've done a great job of their tv viewing experience is a thousand times better than going to a game i'm gonna go to a game sit in the rain people are gonna be loud people are gonna be drunk next to me they're gonna be jerks like a-holes like i don't want to deal with that i can sit at home I can order, you know, whatever I want on Uber Eats or DoorDash. I can make my own food. I get to watch all the games. I've got NFL Red Zone up, so I can watch every single touchdown that I want. If I want to watch my individual game, I can switch over to my individual game. Some people are doing the quad box where they got four games going on at one time. You get your buddy over. All of a sudden, your buddy's got a TV. You've got a quad here, a quad there. All of a sudden, it's an octo box type deal. It's just better to watch a football game at home. And so now all of a sudden the ticket prices, they're up and up and up. It's like, dude, I'm already paying, you know, an arm and a leg for YouTube TV. Why am I going to pay an arm and a leg to go to a game that whatever the price of the ticket is, you're going to have to add another hundred dollars minimum because you're going to have to pay for parking. You're going to have to pay for the food that you get when you get there. You're probably going to want to go to the tailgate beforehand. So you're going to have to pay for that. And just ends up becoming this whole ordeal where a lot of, you know, fans with families are like, I don't want to go and deal with that. I don't want to go and do that. And so there's more tickets for other people to buy. I also think with Seattle, I mean, essentially since what, 2016, maybe 2017, have you really thought you had a shot? Have you really thought you had a shot at winning a Super Bowl? You know, you've been a good team, but have you really thought about being a Super Bowl champion? No. You haven't had playoff success since, what, 2016, 2017? Your last playoff win is against Detroit, I believe. Like, that's your last win. That's 2016, 2017. That, I mean, shoot, that's almost seven years ago, right? Even when you've made the playoffs, you haven't had a shot at it. So as fans, it's like, why would I spend my money on that? Why would I go spend my money on this average team that's only going to make the playoffs and then play on the road, or they're not going to make the playoffs? You get tired of being stuck in purgatory. And the funny thing is, and I keep drawing this comparison, one, because I am a fan of the Blazers, but also because it's the same owner. It's Paul Allen's sisters, Jody Allen, right? In the trust, it is said that she has to sell the team. It doesn't say when she has to sell the team. And I'll tell you right now, if I'm her, I'm not selling that thing until it's the very last thing that I sell. And she's been very clear about not wanting to sell the Seahawks or at least being able to buy a minority ownership stake in it. And you know why? Because they make a lot of freaking money. The Boston Celtics are going to sell for like, 
a couple billion dollars. And the group that bought them didn't buy them that long ago. And they bought them for less than a billion dollars. I mean, shoot, whatever Ishbia bought the Suns for, the Suns are like um, averagely okay, you know, NBA franchise. And he paid a couple billion for them, more than a couple billion, you know? And that's the NBA. The NFL is going to bring in more money. And so you're going to be able to sell it for more. And you need to hold on to it as Jody Allen, because the more that you can hold on to it, the later that you sell it, the more it's going to be worth just by inflation alone. Right. So not that I'm saying that the ownership group isn't willing to come out and spend money. This isn't a Seattle Mariner situation, but I think it's one of the other influences that you have on why people don't want to go to games or aren't as willing to go to games because they don't feel like you have an ownership group like you did back when you had Paul Allen, where Paul Allen was willing to spend whatever he could to win. He didn't care, right? He'd go over the salary cap. We'll figure it out later. You feel like you have an ownership group that knows they have to sell eventually. You know they have to sell eventually, so you're not going to buy that much stake into them. They're raising ticket prices so they can get more money out of you, and you're throwing out an average team. You're the definition of average. Sometimes you make the playoffs, sometimes you don't. You're right about there every single year. Why would you be willing to spend a bunch of money to that? If I'm a Buffalo Bills fan and I live in Oregon, it's my one chance. Every eight years I get to go to a game. I'm going to go to that game. I I just think it's more of a – there's a bunch of different reasons why uh, there would be more Bills fans than there were Seahawks fans or there were more Bills fans than typical at a Seahawks game. And I just think that – a lot of people want to have like, oh, it's quick and easy, and it, it's just not a quick and easy fix. Yeah, the fact that the bill that they haven't played the bill, Bills in so long was it 2018 that the last time that they played was that Rex the stat- Ryan was their coach. That's how long it's been. Rex Ryan was their freaking coach. Yeah, so, so there's there's that. So I mean, yeah, people are going to try to get to the game. That makes sense. You know, as you're kind of describing that red zone multiple screen setup, I'm curious who the first person is that's going to be sitting at the game with the Apple Vision Pro. They're putting red zone on the jumbotron. They're watching the game in there. It's already happened, uh, dude. Someone's already done I'm it. Sure. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I just it. Baseball has the exact opposite thing. Like you and I went to multiple Mariner games this year. Being at the ballpark for baseball, there's nothing better. Don't get me wrong. Like I like watching Mariners baseball on the TV, but guess what? I throw that thing on the TV and I start walking around. And I start doing other things. And then it's like, Oh, okay. This is where we're at. Like the amount of true innings that I sit down and I watch a full game, you know, I don't want to say that it's small, but it only happens if it's a big time pitching matchup. Like I remember when the Mariners got to play Paul Skeens, I sat down and I watched that whole thing one. Cause it was yeah. an earlier Friday game and I had the day off. But, too, because, like, I want to see Paul Skeens. Like, this guy's awesome. Like, I got to check this out. I haven't seen him yet. I haven't had the opportunity. I got to watch this. Uh, I don't know that I would do that the next time Paul Skeens comes on. But for the NFL, it's like I sit down on my couch at 9.59, and I don't move unless I have to pee, and I don't have, you know, a a Mountain Dew bottle can next to me. It's like I got to go. I got to get up and go, and then I'm back, and I'm hanging out. I just think that. You have a viewing experience at home that makes a lot of people just kind of look at the price and the hassle of going to a game and just like, it's not worth it. It's not going to make me feel better. Where at a baseball stadium, it's like, I cannot wait to go to the ballpark because it's going to be better than watching it at home. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. Got a couple more things I want to cover in this game before we get into the preview against the Rams. First off, uh, Derek Hall, you know, that late hit on Josh Allen. Jaron Reed ended up getting in his face. They had an exchange, a little shoving match, grabbing face masks, all that on the sideline. Yep. It looked like they eventually de-helmeted and, uh, you know, talked things out at some point. What was your take on, on that exchange? That's just passion, man. I mean, in an ideal world, that doesn't happen. Players getting up in that situation. Oh, dude, I mean, that happened. I guarantee you that happened all the time. Bruce Irving said it happened all the time during the Legion of Boom. I remember it happened a lot with uh, Richard Sherman and uh, they ended up having to like have, they had the whole Legion of Boom hold hands and then they all jumped around. If you remember that when there was a big (laughs) hubbub Uh, as a former player, like when you play football, you just, you have to be on the edge. Like you just do. You're angrier. 
You're quicker to rage. It just is what it is. There's more stress. And Derek Hall made a stupid play. And Jaron Reed, as a veteran, told him so. And Derek Hall probably knew he made a stupid play and was still pissed off about it. But guess what? Sometimes when we do the wrong thing and someone tells us that we did the wrong thing, we lash back out. It's not the correct response necessarily, but it happens. And so for me, there are going to be a thousand different instances where these things happen. Now, are you always going to catch them on camera? No, not necessarily. Most of the time you want to keep that in-house, right? You want to keep that behind the scenes. But I really didn't have that big of an issue with it. They didn't fight each other. They didn't punch each other. They grabbed each other and they right. yelled. Probably wasn't the nicest conversation. But from everything that I looked into afterwards, it's like Jaron Reed has kind of taken Hall under his wing and is helping him out and they're good buddies. And so that's just football, man. You yell in football. Sometimes you have uncomfortable conversations in an uncomfortable way. In a normal workplace environment, no, you can't just go up and grab someone. You know, you, if I went up to you because I didn't like something that you did, Connor, and I grabbed you by the the shirt collar and started screaming in your face, I'd probably have a lawsuit, let alone be fired, right? Like, there'd be a lot of things You're coming. You're also much bigger than me, so I'd be much more scared than if it was someone that was my size, you know? Right. It, it would just It would just be different. And for whatever reason, in this industry, in football playing, it's different. And so sometimes people are in each other's face in that way. And I think that most people on that sideline probably didn't blink about it. The other thing from this game, you know, this might be absolutely crazy for me to even bring up. Feel free to roast me in the comments if you're listening to this and just completely disagree. Geno Smith, he is the leading passer in all of football. Should we move on or at least give some reps to Sam Howell? I mean, some of these throws that he's made, he's made some great throws. He's looked great in games. He's looked awful in games. He's made some questionable throws. I have at least the same friend that's texting me like, we got to bench Gino. We got to bench Gino. What do you think about Gino Smith w- with how he's running this team right now and and how he's doing so far? Uh, look, I'll be the first person to say that I'm not the most pro Gino guy out there. Gino gives you your best chance to win right now. Uh, Sam Howell has shown that he, while he can sling the rock, he can also make a lot of the same mistakes, um, probably more so than what Gino has made. I, I'll be honest, like I've been in the camp probably the last two years of like, you want to try and go get someone young and see what they can do in the system. It, it's a double edged sword, you know? Like when I look at Gino and, and even when I look at Sam Howe, like it's not like Gino's on some big long term contract. Like, his contract's short, I believe. For next year. I I was I still think there's a way that they can get out of it this year. You know what I mean? And so when I look at it, if Geno Smith gives you the best chance to win the way that this team is set up, then you kind of have to go with Geno. If Sam Howell isn't beating him out in practice, that's Ryan Grubb telling you that Sam Howell's not the best option. And we have to trust the coaching staff because – We all think that Ryan Grubb is a good offensive coordinator, I feel like. That seems like the general consensus around Ryan Grubb. So then we have to trust that he can make the best decisions when it comes to personnel. Now, for me personally, I wish that Seattle had went out and drafted a younger quarterback. It sounds like, at least two years ago, they had some interest in a couple different quarterbacks. They might have even had some interest in a quarterback in this draft class. They didn't end up being able to go get either one of them. So they've decided to continue to go with Gino. I would prefer to move younger because if the younger player hits, you have longer, an opportunity for longer sustained success. Gino is older. He's in his mid thirties. This is about what Gino is going to be. Gino will not improve in my eyes, right? He is just going to, he's better this year because Ryan Grubb, wants to use him more and use him more as a weapon. I would like to go younger. I don't think that Sam Howell is that guy because if he was, he would have beat Gino out already and Grubb would have put in Howell. If you are going to go younger though, just be aware of what a double-edged sword it is because you can find the next CJ Stroud. You can find a guy like Jordan Love. You can find a guy, honestly, like Jaden Daniels. Or you can find Bryce Young, or you can find Anthony Richardson, or you can find Josh Rosen. Are they pulling the trigger too early on Anthony Richardson and Bryce Young? I think there's a conversation to be had about that. But I'll tell you right now, 
you've seen six, 10 games of Anthony Richardson. You've seen what, 16, 17 games of Bryce Young. They don't look very good. Bryce Young was the no questions asked number one pick in that draft. There wasn't really a conversation about C.J. Stroud, at least not a legitimate conversation. Bryce Young looks horrible. I mean, at times he's better than, or he's worse than Jamarcus Russell. Anthony Richardson, this year, he has less than a 50% completion percentage. Man, that's awful. Yeah. It's bad, you know? And so if you're going to make the decision to go young, you have to understand that there are going to be some growing pains. Not everyone comes in and is Russell Wilson. And even in, with Russell Wilson, there were some growing pains early on. And he was in a system that hid him. The system that you have in Seattle, it's not going to hide him. Even if you went and had a younger quarterback in, like let's say, so last year, Geno Smith gets hurt, Drew Locke comes in. They hid Drew Locke in that Philadelphia Monday night game. They hid him. And then they asked him to make big plays. And then because they were down at the end of the game, they said, hey, you really have to step up here and we need you. And he was able to do that. But the system that Pete Carroll ran was run, 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 and then throw in play action. Ryan Grubb is throw, 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 then run because you've thrown so much. (laughs) And because that's the system that he runs, you're going to ask that young quarterback to make a lot of reads quickly and faster than he ever has before in a new NFL system. I mean, even think about it this year, take Jane Daniels out of it. I think that Caleb Williams and Bo Nix have played fairly decent as rookie quarterbacks. What was the main conversation until the first of October? They're not very good and they make bad mistakes. It's gotten picked up a little bit and they seem to be doing better now, but that's what you're going to go through with a rookie quarterback. So are you fully ready to do that? You got to find out. If you're a if you're a get rid of Geno guy, just understand if Sam Howell was better than him, he probably would have beat him out. And if you're gonna go young with a rookie, you got to be ready for growing pains. Are you ready for those growing pains and can you handle that? Yeah, you're gonna have rookie growing pains no matter what, especially with quarterbacks. Unless you're freaking Jaden Daniels, then you just throw Hail Mary bombs to to finish out the game. They're what, like six and two now on the year, seven yeah. and two. Hey. He, he looks he looks freaking awesome. But he's also in a Cliff Kingsbury uh, system that makes a lot of his life easier, and he's looked his best, I'd make the argument, when he's using his legs, which has opened up his passing ability, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's how Josh Allen started his career. It's how Patrick Mahomes started his career to a degree. I mean, shoot, Lamar Jackson is still operating at that level. But eventually – it catches up to you or you catch up to it. And so uh, we'll see if he's able to catch up to it. But if you hit a guy, like if you think that there's a guy in this draft class and somehow Seattle was able to get, like if you think Shador's your guy, you can get him and he's going to do everything you need him to do. Hey man, go do it. Go take a big swing. Cause right it's now I more- feel like you're just going to be in purgatory with, with Gino. You're going to be a fringe playoff team. Some years you'll make it. Some years you won't. If I'm looking at Gino's contract correctly, you can release him after this season. There would be 13 and a half million of uh 20 foot 25 dead cap, but there would be a savings of 25 million. So I was gonna say I, I felt like his even though it was a two year con I feel like every year his contract was set up that they could get out of it relatively okay. Yeah, so there is definitely flexibility there if they if they decide to, to move on someone in the, in this next draft. I wish it would be Cam Ward if he wasn't being drafted number one overall. Um, Shadur, you know, I there's opinions on him as far as like, you know, clubhouse guy and just him, you know, how he plays the game and stuff. It'll be a circus. But yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But uh, yeah, now moving into the Rams preview, they are currently third in the division. They are playing their second divisional game. They played the 49ers and lost in Seattle against them. Arizona is currently on top. They're four and four. The top three teams, Arizona, San Francisco, Seattle, are all four and four. The Los yeah. Angeles Rams right now are three and four. They're coming into Seattle more healthy than they have been in the past. Puka Naku is back. Cooper Cup is there. This is a time where you see how the how the Bills played. There's another potential high-octane offense coming into Seattle. We'll see how they can stop them. Yeah, I mean, when I look at this, I, I told you that the Bills was the start of your gauntlet. You go Bills, Rams, by 49ers, Cardinals, Jets. 
Cardinals, Packers, Vikings. Like that's a gauntlet. That's a real, real gauntlet. And I and I thought looking at the end of the year, it's like, well, Cardinals should be two wins. Vikings, that should be a win. Bears should be a win. Rams, you know, as you go down through the list and that schedule gets real tough, man. It gets real, real tough for you. When I look at this Rams team, they got Puka back. They got Cooper cut back. And it's been very clear, like, you weren't able to run away with this division. The division's always been within reach. I mean, the Rams are essentially a game out right now, right? With everyone else tied at four and four, everyone's going to have to have their bye weeks. Why would they trade Puka Nakua? Because eventually you have to think that you're going to get healthy. Williams right now is running the ball exceptionally for them. He keeps finding the end zone. Um, you don't know if you're going to get DK Metcalf back. You have your fingers crossed that you will. He's questionable right now. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Maybe you let him rest and then just take the extra bye week and see what you can get out of him on the home stretch. But this Rams team is getting healthy, and of course they're getting healthy right when you get ready to play them. They look good. They look good last week. Matt Stafford, he's a wily veteran. He's going to find ways to win. Sean McVay, he's smart. He's a veteran. He knows how to win. He seems like he's always had your number. And you brought McDonald in here to stop him. Uh, you like the the Jones, the fourth little ad. He led your team in tackles after trading for him midweek. Uh, so that can be a little bit. It's a good sign. It's also a scary sign because, you know, he really doesn't know your defense. So he's only going to get better in your defense, which is great. At the same time, you have dudes who have been in that defense since McDonald has gotten hired. What were you doing? Like, how weren't you getting off blocks? Why were you getting set up for this? So um, hopefully that. Jones the fourth in that D line, they keep taking steps up. You have to have it. I don't know if I would qualify it as a must win or a can't lose. It's one of those. You have to win. You have to. You can't go into the bye week, you know, four and five with only what? You would have lost three, you would have lost four out or five out of your last six. You can't do that. You can't go into the bye week losing that many and then guess who you get out of the bye week you get the 49ers so it's not like it gets any easier uh you need this one you need this win against the rams put yourself in a good spot so at minimum when you come back off the bye week you're only a half game out of that first place spot you know depending on everyone's bye weeks between the cardinals and the 49ers and you have to use the bye week to get back and get healthy and you need everyone to get healthy you need williams to be healthy you need witherspoon to get healthy will you ever get Lucas back at tackle. Yeah, the kid out of Finley's been doing okay, but he's still going to make his rookie mistakes. And this is faster than anything he's ever seen because he played freaking D2. You know, I played D2. No offense to D2 athletes. I would assume it's a little bit different. You know, you just need to find a way to get healthy and coming out here and saying, well, we're not healthy. That's why you, you know, you're losing this game or you're losing that game. It's not an excuse anymore. You're halfway through the season, essentially. You're four and four. The first quarter, you dominated. The second quarter, they came back on you. You need to find a way to win the third and fourth quarter if you want to be a playoff team. I think you're really going to see how deep this team is and what kind of resolve they have with how they play the Rams. If they can go out there and win this game, fight, scratch, claw, find a way to get the W, make it look kind of like it did against Atlanta, Okay, maybe maybe you are a fringe playoff team. Maybe you are making it as that six or that seven. If they go out and absolutely get smacked by the Rams, I wouldn't expect much the rest of the year. And that's just honest. Yeah, right now, I mean, Kyron Williams, he is currently 11th in the in the league in rushing yards with 533 over seven games. He is currently second, only behind Derrick Henry in rushing touchdowns. He currently has eight on the year. And then you got Puka Nakua, who came back after like a month plus of being out. Mm-hmm. He casually came in seven receptions, 106 yards, nine targets. He led the team in targets. Then you got Cooper cup. I mean, this is an offense that is, is going to have be another huge test for the Seahawks. And I guess a follow-up question to kind of where they're at in the season right now with where things are going with how things are looking. If they lose this game against the Rams, do you try to trade some pieces before the deadline? Uh, I wouldn't or is it too big. fringy to where it's like <laughs> you, I wouldn't say you know? big, you know? I I I don't know. Like for me, for me, like the way I look at it, like well, who are you gonna come in? Who's gonna come in and be a big name for you? Who's gonna make a big change for you? I would still be more of like, could you trade a couple of the older pieces away to get draft picks if that's what you choose? That, that's what do. I mean. 
I wouldn't hate also them just kind of sitting with where you're at right now and then trusting yourself to make the right moves in free agency. Um, I think that Schneider has shown now he has his issues, uh, especially with getting interior offensive linemen. Like he just struggles at getting quality players in. I mean, every single year it's like guard plays bad, guard plays bad, center plays bad. You know, it, ever since Max Unger left, like you've just been cursed in on your interior line. But you have to trust that Schneider knows how to go and get and evaluate talent because he did it. Like that dude created the Legion of Boom. Uh, you have to trust that McDonald can go in and find guys that work in his system because he's done it. He did it in Baltimore, you know? And, and that's why I call this game a, a can't lose or a must win, whatever you want to tag it. And I think it's that way for both teams. Because when I look at LA, if you lose this game to Seattle, all of a sudden now you're three and five, you're two spots minimum out of first place in the NFC West. Do you really think that you're going to win? Everyone is getting older and older and older. Is it time to fire sale and then try and come back and get your draft picks and understand that you're going to have to tank for a year or two, but can you build it back up into what it was? And then if you're Seattle, I wouldn't say fire sale, but I would definitely say you're looking at young guys to make steps forward. And then it's start watching a lot of college football. One, because it's fun and it's a great way to spend a Saturday. But two, start looking at, you know, some of the guys that could fit certain positions that you want. You know, if you're if you're a get rid of Geno guy, what quarterbacks do you want? Go watch them. Go see what they truly are like on a Saturday. Because I'll tell you right now, I watched the Anthony Richardson propaganda. The way that they talked about him, you would have thought he was Auburn Cam Newton. It's like, dude, he's far from that. When he's at his peak for like a quarter, he can be Auburn Cam Newton. It's not Auburn Cam Newton all the time, you know? Um, you can throw those 60-yard bombs, but, you know, that's the 10% of his completions. He's got great arm strength, and he's a physical freak. But he lacks certain qualities that you need in a quarterback. You know, when, when I just look at this team, it, it's a must win for both teams and one of them can't win it. And so whoever doesn't win it, you kind of probably start looking for next year. Yeah. And, and when you're describing Anthony Richardson, I watched like some of his plays in this last week and kind of like the same DK Met Metcalf thing to where they're both just giants and they're physical specimens and they are completely confident in their ability to make every play. And that means that Anthony Richardson is continually trying to run the ball and he breaks it out to the outside, and then he gets tackled tackled awkwardly, hurts his leg. Now he's out of the game again. You know, this has been a re reoccurring thing over the past few years. And at some point, you just got to kind of realize, hey, I'm supposed to, I need to stay healthy. I need to stay back in the pocket, and I need to throw the ball away if I need to and just take another down. Right. Well, I can't go through his reads either. Like, it's very clear that he has always been an athletic freak, and so that's what he's relied on. He can't go through his reads, and – so he uses his legs when the first or second option isn't there. And that's fine, man. When you're in high school, when you're taking on the kid who's, you know, spent seven periods studying chemistry and calculus and English, and, you know, he's the starting linebacker at six foot 180. Oh, big high school kid. It's a little bit different when you're taking on a dude that that's his full time job. If he doesn't make this tackle, his kids don't eat like <laughs> it, it means a lot more to that dude. That dude's in the film room being like, OK, these are the tendencies that they have out of here. He's going to escape left 80 percent of the time. As soon as I get a one two count in my head, that ball has been thrown. I'm going to the left side now hard because I think that's where he's going to escape. It's just it's a different game. It's a different game. Game time is 125 this Sunday. Uh, currently, game time weather is supposed to be 54 degrees and cloudy. Last time, it was supposed to be like 50 degrees and sunny. Turned it to be a bit of a rain game. Yeah. Um, right now, the Rams are predicted 50.3% chance of winning. Right now, the spread is minus 1.5 Rams. The over-under is 47.5. What do you think about the outcome of this game, realistically? Uh, I kind of feel like if Seattle is going to win it, it needs to be a shootout. So I wouldn't hate the over i just think that both teams can score and seattle has shown an issue defensively of stopping the run offensively the passing attack has to get better and you have to finish in the red zone like i think when this year is said and done and most seattle coaches and fans go back and look at this year you're gonna look at your losses detroit you made a couple big mistakes in the red zone 
and that's why you lost. You made two mistakes in the red zone. You lost that game. Against the Giants, look, to be honest, you were lucky to be in that one. But if you just block a D lineman, that kick doesn't get blocked. That's really a – it's a nine-point loss. It's really a three-point loss, you know. And then you look at the 49ers game, that's 36-24. How many times were you in the red zone and you turned the ball over or you turned the ball over and gave San Francisco the ball in your red zone, right? If you just take away the two interceptions, that's a completely different ball game. So, and then Buffalo, I mean, shoot, if you don't shoot yourself in the leg, I mean, you have a ball that snapped 10 yards over Gino's head. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's earned goal from the 40. Like it's ridiculous, right? And then you step on him. So it's like, if you can finish your red zone issues right now, or you could find a way to fix them. Maybe you do have an extra win or two. Seattle's got to get that cleaned up against the Rams because the Rams are a team that they will take advantage of that. They're a smart team. They'll figure out a way to win if you give them multiple opportunities to do it. And then a few injury notes to wrap it up. DK Metcalf did not practice on Wednesday due to, due to that MCL sprain that sideline sidelined him last week. Mike McDonald said that he's optimistic that Metcalf will practice Thursday and play Sunday versus the Rams. Also, Devin Witherspoon now has a new foot injury that kept him from practicing on Wednesday. Abe Lucas and George Fant both were limited. Abe Lucas won't be ready to play until at least week 11, but then Fant potentially can return this weekend against the Rams. So we'll see if those guys can make it back. Obviously, having DK Metcalf back will, will be a big big addition and, and will be a big key in trying to take down the Rams at home. So thank you all for, for tuning in. Thank you, Will, again, for joining me. Make sure to follow him at Will Ordner on Twitter. We'll see you on next week's recap.